Okay, so this um, talk is really kind of two or possibly three talks um, um, stuck together. Um, so I couldn't really decide what to speak about, so I'm going to speak about everything that um, I have worked on. So I would say I have worked on, but other people have included me in. Um, okay, so um, let's do this. So, I first want to talk about um, some work that was um, led by uh, a guy from the Met Office Hadley Centre called Chris Roberts. It involved myself and Matt Palmer briefly discussed it earlier in the week uh, and uh, Doug McNeil. And what we were interested in was the question of what is the likelihood of the current hiatus event and what is the likelihood that it may continue. Um, so uh, what we did, actually a very kind of simple analysis, um, we first estimated the global mean temperature trend due to the force component, uh, um, so anthropogenic and natural uh, forcings. Um, and we did this by averaging all the CMIP5 um, simulations together uh, um, to get a kind of smooth estimate of the, the force response. Um, it turns out that perhaps the CMIP models, CMIP5 models may be slightly over responding to the forcing, um, but we can take that into account by scaling our um, sort of background trend up and down. Um, we then took the uh, control runs and detrended them and then uh, sampled um, periods of high and uh, so negative sample periods of negative trends in global mean temperature from these control runs and kind of added them on top of the force response. Um, by using control runs, we get a bigger sample size. Um, uh, and so we generate kind of, if you like, a large number of synthetic uh, ensembles by adding the control run variability with the correct phase to the uh, observed, uh, to the force response, and then we estimate the probability of different lengths uh, um, of hiatus events. We also uh, sub-selected some of the models based on their ability to simulate intranual variability. That didn't make much difference. Um, so we estimate the probability and occurrence of hiatus events uh, of different periods and of potential what we call surge or accelerated warming events following on from a, a hiatus. And we can also look, of course, in the models at what's going on in these events. So here is the, um, so the red uh, is just the different observational uh, records, uh, different estimates of the observed global mean temperature. Uh, the gray lines are the uh, individual CMIP5 ensembles, and the blue lines are those models for which there were multiple ensemble members you could make. Um, so this is just really um, um, for display purposes. We made a kind of average of all these to get the force response, and the force response we estimate to be uh, about 0.2 degrees C per decade. So in order to overcome 0.2 degrees C per decade, you must have a natural variability trend of minus 0.2 degrees C per decade. Uh, so what these um, uh, figures show, uh, um, I'll take a bit of time to explain them. So on the x-axis is the trend length, uh, and on the y-axis is the magnitude uh, of the trend. So this is in sampling all these different uh, control runs. So, for example, uh, a trend length of 10 years and a trend magnitude of minus 0.2 degrees C per decade, i.e. what we need to have to overcome the force warming trend. Uh, and you read off here, these are contours of uh, frequency or probability. Uh, and you see, if I look on my screen, uh, the probability of a 10-year hiatus is about 10%. So we wouldn't be surprised, given a force response of 0.2 degrees C per decade, uh, we wouldn't be surprised to see a, a hiatus event that lasted 10 years uh, in length. For a 20-year hiatus event, um, the probability is less than 1%. So we might think that it'd be extremely unlikely uh, that we would see um, a 20-year um, hiatus event. So maybe we've had about a 15-year uh, 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 event, um, which is maybe about 5% uh, probability. 
Um, one uh, um, interesting thing you can do is to say, okay, you know, the probability of a 20-year hiatus event is really quite small. However, if we are already in a hiatus event, um, uh, so uh, this is, uh, okay, so um, if, for example, we have already experienced 10 years or, or indeed 15 years of a, uh, a hiatus event, what's the probability that it will continue? And this turns out to be higher than just the raw probability of a 20-year hiatus event because uh, if you're in the kind of low point of an oscillation or um, some kind of red noise process, you know, you're, it, it will take some time to get out of it. Um, so it turns out that the, the probability of, of a continued hiatus uh, uh, of another further five years uh, uh, of, of a 0.2 degrees C is about 15%, so uh, much larger than the, the less than 1% we see here. So if you're in an event, it's harder to get out. Um, what we also did was look at uh, some of the kind of processes that were going on, uh, and it turns out that a hiatus event uh, is associated with a transport of heat from the upper ocean, uh, what's that say, 100 meters, uh, into the deep ocean, uh, and if you have a reversal or a surge, uh, then that heat gets transported from the deep ocean uh, into the upper ocean. And the net uh, total Earth system energy is kind of round about zero for these things. So that in these hiatus events that we um, identified in the control runs, uh, there was no kind of energy input or output from the system. It's just a reorganization of, of heat within the heat content within the ocean. And um, I should say that the the majority of the hiatus events that we found in the control runs were of Pacific origin, greater than 90%. Although we did find some which were of Atlantic origin and just a couple which involved uh, heat exchanges in the Southern Ocean. So it is possible, in the models at least, to, to see uh, hiatus events which uh, arise out of different ocean basins. Uh, this is the... the uh, the, the, PD, the, condition, the PDF conditioned on uh, already having a 10-year uh, um, uh, hiatus period, uh, and it turns out that, uh, you know, that the probability of the hiatus continuing is about 14 15%, as I showed on the previous graph, uh, but the probability of an accelerated warming or a surge uh, is about 50%. So, um, uh, and the, the patterns of SSTs uh, that you see during hiatus. This is like a continued five-year hiatus event. This is a five-year surge or accelerated warming event. Uh, look like this kind of PDO um, pattern, although they're not quite a mirror image uh, um, of each other. Whether that's sampling or not, uh, I guess Chris has done some sort of statistical test uh, on these. Okay, so in summary, um, if we focus on natural variability as the cause of the hiatus, uh, and ex in ex in assuming an expected force response of 0.2 degrees C per decade, um, the probability of a vari variability-driven hiatus is about 10%, but less than 1% for a 20-year. But if we're in a hiatus event, then the probability of it continuing is much larger. Uh, so slightly different numbers here. Um, and uh, uh, an accelerated warming is more likely than not, which means 50%. Okay, so... Uh, Following on from that, um, uh, and following on from the meeting that we had in Aspen in the, in the summer, uh, uh, John Fife um, was interested in this problem too, um, but you know, we thought we could actually do a bit better by taking into account what the current state of the um, ocean atmosphere system is, because you know, we have the ability to do seasonal forecasting. So what uh, he's done uh, here uh, in this work, which is as yet unpublished, uh, it was prepared in the summer. Uh, this is, if we focus here on the global mean temperature anomaly, uh, this is from 1980 uh, up to the present day, uh, and tacked on here in red is the Canadian seasonal forecasting system, which actually runs out to a year, uh, initial, initialized in the summer. Uh, the, the, the scale on the x-axis changes a bit here, so be wary of these um, plots. But what you see, uh, not surprisingly, is this big El Nino event that's happening at the moment, and following the El Nino event, a kind of rather rapid decline, um, but not declining um, to below 
this, this kind of plateau period um, here. Uh, we can take this kind of idea further, and uh, what, what John did was to, um, they have a large ensemble of canny SM2 historical type runs, so just free running experiments, uh, but you can kind of, it has a pretty good ENSO cycle, so you can select ENSO events like this from the, uh, from this kind of database of, of um, years of historical simulation, and then you can work out uh, what the, um, the kind of trend in the following years uh, is. And uh, there are a number of lines on this, but the, the crucial um, aspect is this kind of light blue shading, which hasn't come out very well, and this blue blob with the error bars here, um, which shows the, um, the, the, the global average temperature uh, sort of 2016 to 2017. So this is kind of extending the seasonal forecast using an analog uh, type approach. And you see that it, even in a couple of years' time, the temperature doesn't get anywhere near the kind of 20, 2000 to 2014 mean. Um, uh, we were trying to persuade him to push this further. He wasn't very confident uh, uh, in doing that. Um, but so, you know, maybe this is one way of assessing the likelihood of uh, continued. Um, but it looks like, uh, you know, the, the idea of diving back into a kind of hiatus type uh, climate is, is pretty small. Um, okay, so that, oh, oh, yeah, and just to say, this is the sort of slightly updated El Nino forecast from the, now from the Met Office forecast system, which again shows this, you know, we're just about there in terms of the current ENSO, and uh, as I said, uh, large El Nino events have a kind of tendency to k kill themselves off, so we get this kind of rapid, you know, back to neutral conditions quite um, rapidly the next year. Uh, although if you look at Nino 4, um, that the forecast suggests that the Nino 4 region, the kind of central uh, to West Pacific, remains warm. Uh, and so that's indicative of perhaps a longer, you know, a, a transition to like more of a positive um, PDO type uh, phase. But again, it's only a seasonal forecast, so we're not really going far enough. Okay. Um, uh, Okay, the, 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 this, this second bit of the talk is really, um, I'll, I can perhaps go through this quite quickly because um, uh, it kind of follows on or it backs up what Scott said this morning uh, in, his, in his talk. He was talking about the trends over the, you know, from about 1979, you know, where we have kind of good observations, the beginning of the satellite record. Uh, he was talking about the, the strength of the trade winds across the Pacific uh, based on MSLP, uh, measurements. Here, uh, what I've computed is just the trend in Haddist over the period 1979 to 2014, so a 35 year period. So, you know, that, this is a reasonably long uh, uh, period. And what we see here is this kind of classical picture that we see many times already in this meeting cooling in the East uh, Pacific, uh, uh, warming, relative warming in the West and, and in the Indian Ocean. And uh, if you um, look in the models, uh, at this, in, so these are historical plus RCP 4.5, spliced on. Apologies for the, uh, the lines over the land. This is because I'm using a, a, a sort of vintage piece of software uh, to do this, uh, to do these graphs. Um, uh, and if I compute an SST index, uh, which is this one, this box minus this box, um, as a kind of indication of the, the gradient of temperature across the Pacific here, and um, plot that out as a, as a time series. Um, it's clearly got lots of interannual and decadal variability, but if you fit a trend, um, uh, uh, it's, it's a sort of slight negative trend as indicated in the, the contour plot. Um, I'm not suggesting that it necessarily is a trend um, um, because of this interannual to decadal variability, but if you take the null hypothesis that it is a trend, uh, and then we, we compute here are the observed trends in the vertical bars from various different SST data sets. These are their CMIT-5 models, uh, a histogram of about 100 simulations, different models, different initial conditions, uh, and none of the models actually get a magnitude. So this is consistent with Scott's presentation that uh, the models do not, e either that the real world has produced a very rare decadal stroke multi-decadal event in the Pacific, or the models have not got high enough decadal, uh, decadal multi-decadal variability. Uh, and of course, this is all consistent with, um, so this, this sort of SST index is consistent. Here are the trade wind strength 
um, so you can match up things. And here's the PDO uh, index. So if this meeting was being held in a couple of months' time, uh, this graph would probably look a bit different because I could put on 2015. That's meant to say 2015 up here. And uh, well, from the, from the 10 months of data that I had up to this point, well, we see a PDO, a pretty strong kind of PDO index, as we might have expected because of the ENSO, and, uh, um, and uh, um, a, a fairly strong warm East Pacific relative to um, West Pacific. Um, so is it a trend? Is it variability? Um, if it is a trend, then it's not, well, it's, it's, it's partially consistent with the kind of ocean dynamical thermostat hypothesis, uh, which has already been mentioned uh, um, and has published here by our new friend, Amy Clement. Um, uh, so this, none of the models really do this. Uh, um, so this kind of um, theory has largely been, I wouldn't say discredited, but uh, it's not popular. Um, um, so maybe we need to go back to revise our theories. Uh, um, and, and, and as I said uh, earlier on, you know, these, these, because, because these trends are kind of broader than just the equatorial region, none of these theories really necessarily completely apply. Where am I going next? So this is kind of near the, near the end. So are these really forced trends in the Pacific? If they are, then we need to revise our theories about forced trends. If it's decadal variability, then either the models um, uh, don't have a large enough decadal variability. So either of these two options is a kind of failure in theory and models. Uh, it could be a fluke large amplitude natural variability, but in other areas of climate science, we usually call this detection. Uh, if something is outside the range of natural variability we see in models. So we can't have one, one rule for things that we kind of know, know about and understand, one rule for things that we don't know about and understand. And are we about to enter a surge? And, and finally, I just, uh, maybe you can read these for yourselves, but um, I just make some notes uh, about general, uh, about the, the general aspects of decadal uh, climate variability and predictability. Um, I think, uh, you know, closing the energy budget has been a great triumph in, uh, in uh, climate science. Um, but for these types of uh, uh, features, we're looking at order 0.1 watts per meter squared per decade trends in, in these, you know, the various terms in the heat budget. And I guess, well, I'm not on, uh, I don't know much about measurements, but I guess these are hard to measure, hard to quantify. So that means I think we're really forced to look at spatial patterns, uh, mechanisms, and uh, you know, perhaps more impacts. You know, we focus a lot on oceanic variables uh, from the point of view of understanding what's going on, uh, but maybe we need to think more about uh, atmospheric processes, storms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that might lead us also on to the impacts part. Uh, uh, spatial, uh, you know, forcing forced decadal variability tends to be thought about more at the global scale. Perhaps we need to think more about the spatial patterns of response. Uh, of course, there's been some work on that. And my final conundrum, uh, which I've told a few people around the room, is that uh, at least it looks like the Atlantic seems in some way more predictable uh, than the Pacific, but the Pacific seems to be more influential, uh, at least on the global mean uh, temperature. So thank you. <laughs>